Welcome to the Francisca Show podcast on jewishcoffeehouse.com, the show where I give a voice to Jewish issues, topics, and people. I'm Francisca, your host. Welcome back, France Dans. I'm so excited to be doing this episode today. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. Number one, I'd like to remind you that we are a part of jewishcoffeehouse.com, so make sure to check out the other podcasts on this network. And we do have some excellent topics and podcasts that are in the backlog. We have all these interesting topics that have been covered. Many of you reach out requesting topics to be covered. Well, guess what? We've covered a lot of them. So make sure to scroll back and you could have on demand over 200 episodes now just for you. Next, I am a podcast success coach and I help People, organizations, companies launch podcasts, grow their podcasts, monetize their podcasts. And lastly, this episode is brought to you by Appleseed Communications. If you are looking to establish your authority in your industry, I highly recommend Appleseed Communications. Ashley Crouch is an executive brand strategist for fast growth companies seeking high end media platforms across TV, national outlets, TEDx and top podcasts. So what are you waiting for? Text, let's go to 773-770-4377 for a strategy session to build your custom plan. And if you do work with Ashley, please do make sure to tell her that Francisca sent you. Without any further ado, enjoy this episode. I can't wait to see you in the chat and let's continue the conversation. Here we go. Welcome back to the Francisca Show. Today with us, we have Rabbi Ellie Portal, certified therapist, fellow podcaster as well. He's the host of the podcast called Rolling with the Punches. And I'm so excited to be doing this episode with you today to talk about Shidduchim, specifically for people with physical disabilities. And there's so much to talk about here. I was just having a conversation with my five year old yesterday when she asked me what that special seat for the pool is. And I decided that was a great opening to start the conversation. So without any further ado, welcome to the show, Ellie. Thank you so, so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I really think that a lot of the conversations that you're bringing out are important conversations, are real conversations, and are conversations that very often I see as a therapist in the room and not often so much outside. And sometimes there's the shame or the fear to discuss those things. So I think it's really important that people are hearing voices and it's a little bit of what I try to do as well on my podcast. So happy to hear that. Great minds think alike. Thank you. It's an excellent podcast. I highly recommend it. And I also want to add to it. Someone today brought up to me, we need to further remove the stigma around getting therapy and people going to therapy. And the conversations that happen on this podcast sometimes are very similar to what therapy can be. And I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I don't know, but I've been on the other side of the chair and I know that a lot of the conversations look like that. For the sake of this conversation, I've been to therapy. I go to therapy. I've tried all different types of therapy. Depends on what I'm looking to work on at the time. But the way I look at it is there's something I can improve on in my life. Let me find the expert. And I do that with anything in my business. I do that with home improvement projects. And I do that with self-growth as well. And I encourage other people to do that as well. And if I haven't made that clear before on the podcast, I'm a therapy fan. And if I could start a fan club, I'd be the leader of it. So I think you started it already. And I think that 10 years ago, people would be a lot less afraid to say the things that you just said. And I think that's very, very important. And I think it's very hopeful kind of for where things are moving in that direction. Wonderful. Let's get started. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know a little bit from listening to your podcast. I am a therapist. I also happen to be a a middle school Rebbe here in the Five Towns. And basically by design, I think the way my life kind of certain decisions that I didn't decide for myself kind of threw me into this world where something I'm very, very passionate about is trying to be supportive for those who are in Shadokim. My wife and I try to make Shadokim or Hashem we've made. I would say typical Shadokim or whatever the term is that's proper. We have to work on labels soon. People um, who don't but, have labeled issues right. yet. We don't uh, know exactly, that. Exactly. That are, that are not known. Exactly. But because of my own experience through the process of Shadokim, I recognize a lot of the challenges that are unique to those with a physical disability. I don't want to go into my entire story, although maybe I can give places where people can look at that. I've done a couple of episodes on sharing my own personal story so they could hear it there. I want to try and perhaps touch on something 
that I haven't touched on in other podcasts, if that's okay. Absolutely. So in a nutshell, in two, three sentences, tell us about your backstory and what your physical disability is. Okay, so I'm going to do that in a way in a second. Before I even mention that, what I think is important to almost like as an introduction to this, which is like a, a very rabbinic thing to do, introduce everything you're doing with an introduction. I heard a great idea from my Rabbi, Rabbi Rosner, and he said the following. We say at the end of davening, Ein kelokenu, and then we say me kelokenu. Svartim say that every single day and Ashkenazim every once in a while. And basically what that means is there's no one like our God. And then we say me kelokenu, who's like our God? Sometimes they sing it in shul, et cetera. In any event, he brought up an amazing thing, right? It sounds like we're saying in Kelokini, which almost sounds like the answer. There's no one like our God. And then we ask and we say me Kelokini, who's like our God? And he said an amazing thing, which I think is so important as an introduction to this topic, which is that there are a lot of questions that come up in Yiddishkeit particularly, and then also in terms of societally issues that we deal with as Jews and within the firm community. And they're questions that we have, and we don't always have clear answers, but it is so, so important that our anchor, what we start the conversation with is in Kelokina, there's nothing like Hashem, right? We know that answer. We have to concretize and strengthen our moon and be tough. And then we can, on that foundation, begin to ask questions of what are we going to do here and what are we going to do there? And I think this is very important because it's very easy to tear down the shidduch system and say, you know, this is wrong and that's what's wrong. But there's a reason why it is the way that it is and it's not perfect. And we can ask questions and we can try and figure out how to improve it. But throughout my struggles, and there were struggles with it that we're going to get into, I, Baruch Hashem, never felt this feeling of like, this is terrible. Let's tear this down. I don't understand. It's out to get me those types of things, which I think sometimes are common. And it was more like, I understand that this is a question and I don't necessarily have the best answer to it. And it brought me back to in Kelokanu, that there's like, I know that maybe the, the only answer to this is that there's no one but Hashem. I, I can't answer these on my own. So with that, I want to formulate the problem that comes up. I will tell over a story, which is partially my story, but partially a lot of stories that I've seen through the process. So let's give an example. Take a, either someone who is born with being blind, deaf, well, for the purposes of this, we'll use a, a male, although some of the experiences are the same for male and some of them are a little bit different for a female. Take someone who is either born with some disability, some genetic disability, fill in the blanks, but it, it doesn't impact their cognition at all. Or someone like, let's say in my instance, who um, Baruch Hashem, like when I was born, I was healthy. And then when I was six years old, I was in a car accident that left me in a wheelchair with a spinal cord injury. In any event, they go through their life and they are, again, 100% bright, intelligent, accomplished. They're in mainstream schools. Yes, they need accommodations here and there. But again, Baruch Hashem, depending on what issues they work through and how they figure out to accommodate themselves, they're able to adjust to their lifestyle with their disability. And some of them are even able to make friends with the classmates that they have in their mainstream schools. In my scenario, I went to Eretz Yisrael as well, which was a big deal. And we had to make the accommodations for that. Throughout their childhood, there are difficulties. But in terms of feeling accepted, because there was never a cognitive issue for them, and that's a whole different area, which I don't want to really touch. They were well-adjusted and part of the system and perhaps needed accommodations. Those are, let's say, the best case scenarios. But undoubtedly, what happens in this scenario is all of a sudden when you enter the age of Shaduchim, despite the fact that everyone accepted you and despite the fact that everyone said, wow, you're so great, you're so amazing, you're so inspiring, all of the catchphrases, and you're the best person in the world, all of a sudden when it comes to Shaduchim, it's like everyone else, they're running after the boys with a stack of resumes. And over here, all the people who said, you're so great, you're so wonderful, you're such an inspiration, all of a sudden, like, where are they with the ideas? What happened to all the great things that you thought about me? I would think that someone who you said so great, so amazing, that would be like the type of person you would want for your daughter. And all of a sudden you kind of feel that, and I'm describing the emotion, not the reasoning behind it, but the emotion is you feel like, what happened? I was living my entire life. I kind of had like this system where I thought I understood how I was going to navigate with my disability. And all of a sudden you enter the, the world of Shaduchim and all those things of being inspiring and great and accomplished are not there. And, and in my particular scenario, I grew up in the five towns. I'm one of five boys. I am number four of five. And I watched my 
first four brothers get those stack of resumes because we're very, very similar and they're accomplished all-star people, really the, the best. I'm so lucky with the family that I have. And I watched them really, really, really be sought after. And everyone was asking, what are they dating? And I want you for my daughter. And people literally running after them. And we're not so different, myself from my brothers. And I was nervous, I think, already from the age of like 16. What's this going to be? Because I was watching my brother's date. And then I saw all of the fears that I had of what's going to be. And I understood a little bit weren't taking place for me. And I didn't feel run after. And I didn't feel like people were chasing after me on the fact that the very contrary, I felt like people didn't want to take the risk or to get involved or even consider kind of that area in terms of my shit of prospects. So that is my story in a nutshell. I want to ask you, and feel free not to answer this, but yes, Shadokham is basically the brutally honest market. Like you could be whoever you are once you enter Shadokham. You come down to a piece of paper, your photo, maybe, and that's it. You're judged like a piece of meat, basically. So anyone who has weight issues, perhaps, and I'm apologizing to all the people in all the categories or mixing the categories, but any disadvantage, like if your parents are Bali Chuba or Giorim, you have somebody who's divorced in your family or off the derech, or just anything added on, you are at a disadvantage you could place blame like this is this one's fault. And if you're overweight, you could technically lose the weight or this is not something you have control over. Give us more information. How does it feel different? And what are those feelings around that? The answer is it may not be different. And I want to be clear about this because I spent a lot of time in this. I don't have the magic answer. Sometimes you have clients coming in and I have this anxiety and I have a trip tomorrow to Israel. So like, can we get it fixed before then? And sometimes there is a serious process where these issues are not fixed overnight. And I'm afraid that the answer to this in terms of how to ultimately find the right one for yourself is not an overnight process and there's not a quick solution. And I think the examples that you gave may be very, very similar in a certain way of there are certain things that are beyond my control and I'm now being judged for it, even though I recognize the fact of my value and even other people recognize it. And we could talk a little bit about why it is. I think that the shidduch system and for good reason is built on a lot of commitment. But there's not like a trial period of like, let's see how it is. So you're making a decision that's highly pressurized. And so people want the perfect match. People don't want to hear this, this, and this issue when they're making a match, which Amir Tzashem should be for the rest of their life. I think for me, I, and this was kind of the logic side, which I often work with, is that I fully understood why this was happening. It just really didn't feel very good. And I didn't know what the answer was. And anyone who is a different race or color also experiences that as well. Correct. This this could come up in every area because it's more or less the same issue. My question is, is it okay, especially because we're working with a match system, not necessarily, I don't want to say personal or not personal, but you're working with a third party. It's not like you have somebody, you're walking on a runway show and your prospect is saying yes, no, yes, no, or like J Swipe or Tinder. Right. You have a third party here qualifying. I heard you speak about this on the podcast, how you have the three shatchanim who work with people who have physical disabilities. And it's like offensive when other people say, go to them because you deserve to be set up with people who also have other physical disabilities, right? Does that make sense? Can you Are you asking have, a question? The question is, how is that offensive? Or can you explain this experience? Well, I'll explain to you what, a typical experience will often look like for someone who has a physical disability. Very often what will happen is, so you're in the shit of process, just for starters, people don't even know where to start because they feel so overwhelmed. Most people understand the problem. They don't really see what the solution is. Like I pointed out, the solution itself is not clear cut, do this and you will get this. It's more like, how can I put myself in the best position? And Amuna is the greatest tool that we have in part of this process. In any event, what typically happens then is you'll give it to your friends, your parents' friends, they'll try and network and nothing will kind of come back on that avenue because of the obvious blocks. Sometimes people will make a suggestion. They'll say, oh, you know, I happen to have this great idea. This girl, you know, like she uses a wheelchair. So like you could already get a sense that where are they thinking? What's like the thought process that they're going through? They're going through, okay. I see this issue and they do see the issue, 
And the only, like, who could I possibly think? Because I make sure of him, right? So you have to try and figure out. Both sides need to say yes. So who could possibly say yes to, like, someone who is in a wheelchair? And, okay, this person also has this issue. So their mind is immediately going to, like, their archive of all of the people who have baggage, which is completely invalidating to you as a human being. What does it mean? Because it means that they're viewing you as someone who has baggage. And you may be, right, a Harvard professor and in the top law firm, and you may have every mile, and specifically the ones that are important for a healthy marriage, and all of a sudden, because of your suggestions, the same way, I think something that hopefully everyone can relate to, take someone who doesn't have a clear, any of those laundry lists of things that you mentioned before, someone who's in a typical shidduch scenario, and they get a suggestion of someone who has one of those things. If you speak to most people, if they're being honest, they'll say, wow, I felt like, what do they think of me? And it, it doesn't change that feeling from the human experience doesn't change because someone has a disability because I don't view myself as a disability. So I'm feeling the same thing of you are only viewing me as this piece of baggage that needs to be resigned to the fate of this person. And therefore all my suggestions will reflect what I really feel about you or what your prospects are in this process. Can I push a little further? Push. We're, okay. We're not dealing with a job interview here where only your cognitive skills potentially as a therapist are important to the job, which is why you, as a friend, maybe unless you were kicked off the sports team, which is a clear <laughs> indicator of your physical abilities, right. that wouldn't interfere. Now, when it comes to marriage, and I've heard many parents say that when they're looking for the for their son, for the first shidduch, or their daughters, their first shidduch, you want to give them every advantage as possible. This isn't their chesed case. This isn't their chesed project for the year. Correct. They want to marry them off. And even with those shidduch, I mean, you have so many quick divorces and so many issues. You want to match them up with somebody who has their qualifications. And the reason someone with a physical disability may be matched with another person who has a physical disability is because they have a similar human experience where they had to navigate the world as someone less than or different or less capable or whatever it is. Why can't that be something like we're trying to connect humans here with similar experiences? For example, you have kids who go off the dark or they're searching for a couple of years, then they come back on. Automatically, if somebody has a broken engagement or divorce, do you want to pair them because they had that similar experience, not because, oh, you're, you have that scarlet A, you don't qualify anymore. Why would you want to get married to somebody who's never been married before, who's 10 years younger than you, has no life experience in that way? You want to marry somebody who has had a similar journey to you. So this pairing may seem very unfair, but again, we're not talking about a job interview or a feature in a magazine. We're talking about two humans who are going to start a family. It's a great question. Again, I'm happy we're getting kind of like to the heart of the issue. Number one is I think what may disappoint people is I am not the person who's saying, yeah, you know, everyone should give it a chance. For me, I'm more grounded in the reality of that I fully understand that is why what happens, happens. Uh, that's, that's why I kind of wanted to take this opportunity on this interview to more address the issue. I, I don't have the solution and I'm not saying, oh, it's completely unreasonable for someone who may have a lot of other suggestions to push themselves to go with someone who has this. I'm, I'm not at all suggesting that because I don't think that that makes so much sense for them in their decision as well. I'm more highlighting the issue that comes about. In terms of, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm a little bit behind in the Dafyomi, but something had come up, which I was, to me, whenever you're learning through something, you tend to look at it through the lens of what you're working through, which is why you could have so many people look at Torah and come up with something else. Anyway, I was so fascinated by this discussion that took place in the Gemara Nyevamos. I think it's around Daf Kofiyot Aleph area, that territory. And the Gemara had a discussion where basically a man had two wives and they couldn't figure out which one was like the one that he was more married to. Anyway, one of them was, let's say, 12 years old, like roughly around there. And the other one was deaf. And the Gemara was trying to have this figuring out which one would he probably have preferred to have married, like trying to get into the psyche of the man. So it said, well, you know, like the one who is a little bit younger, so she'll mature in the future. Whereas the one who's already older, even though she's deaf, like she's a little bit more mature. Anyway, the Gemara then said something which, as soon as I said it, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like this was like a, a, like a punch in my gut. I felt that I didn't even read the next line after. 
And the Gemara said, but if he's deaf, then it's very likely that he preferred to have married the deaf one. And, and the idea that I saw based on the Mepharshim is because, like you just pointed out, which is one viewpoint that I would say most people who are not experienced in this area will assume this is kind of like the outside rationale. If it's not your Parsha, this is where people will go. It's like people like shared experience. And therefore, because of that, he would prefer to marry this. And I was like really, really upset because I very much disagree based on my experience with what that was. And I was so happy to see that this is actually a Machlokas. And the second opinion was, is actually, no, it's not conclusive that he would want that because perhaps he would actually want the other one. And I happen to see couples as well. I think very often, you know, when you get into the discussion of what should I be looking for in a marriage, it's very important that you have someone that compliments you as opposed to being married to your identical clone. And what I mean by that is that very often I had a shotgun once who said, I told her kind of like my story, whatever it is. And she said, I assume that you're okay marrying someone in a wheelchair because you use a wheelchair. And my gut feeling was like, do people in a wheelchair all of a sudden, like you've now been able to frame and kind of put into a box what every person will feel? Is it not possible that someone in a wheelchair could also want to marry someone who's not disabled? Aside from that, meaning just think about how logistically complicated you're making life where I can't compliment that area. I'm, I'm compounding the issue. Much more important, and I think and what makes a much more healthy and successful marriage is when you have two people, which are different, man and woman by definition, already kind of support that difference that are coming together to try and make a shlemus, a, a, com- a complete and greater whole. So I think to reduce someone who has a disability to someone else that has a disability, while I hear that, and that's often the argument people make, I think to say that everyone feels that way is a gross misstatement. I will say that I don't speak for everyone's experience. And there are people that I know, because a lot of people do reach out, that actually prefer someone with a disability. People who have a disability actually prefer to have someone with a disability. It's unclear whether it's specifically because of that shared experience or maybe because they don't want to face the rejection that they feel will be inevitably experienced by them. Thanks for clarifying that. I'd like to hear some more examples of things that people say that, as you said, reduces you to a person with disability as if that's your only description when you have so many other great aspects to your life. For me, and this is something that I had someone on my podcast, Siona, who has a great story because I wanted to get the female perspective on this. I don't want to just speak for all males. And I think she was very, very helpful in providing another voice and perspective for me. I think for me, I was very, very turned off by anything that suggested that because you're in a wheelchair, you need someone with outward baggage, the baggage that I decide. Now, I do think, and when I do counsel, those with disabilities, I do very much stress the importance of being open-minded. I think you need to be open-minded. If you are in a dream world in terms of where you are and what your reality is, that's only going to hurt you. And ultimately, reality will hit you in the face and you'll have to open up your eyes. But one's process of being open-minded does not need to be the way the shotgun thinks. And I think that's an important discussion when we really kind of work through things of what are you comfortable with? It really depends on what the person can be comfortable with. But in terms of what people experience, and I can't speak for my own experience necessarily because for me, I really did not work with the Shat Khanim who specifically worked with the disabled community because their general process is, okay, let's pull together all the disabled singles and try and figure out a system that works because that's the way you get the most dates because both sides need to be willing to compromise. I wasn't comfortable with that approach. Baruch Hashem, I was able to meet my wife on why you connects, which now my wife and I are Shad Khanimar. And I felt that was kind of the best route that gave me access to a pool of singles that hopefully some of them would be open-minded enough to be impressed by my qualities and, get, and be willing to give me a chance to know me better. Could we break down for somebody who's never thought about how to set people up who have physical disabilities? Are there different categories that you can break them down to? I know offhand, just from listening a little bit, you have the people born, and then you have the people who've acquired injuries over their lives, unfortunately. You could have illness, meaning let's say someone who is recovering from cancer, which sometimes comes up. It's somewhat different depending on how far out that was and when that took place and the likelihood of it coming back. But sometimes that could actually impact them. Break it down for us. You don't have to do it in a hierarchy, but in categories. 
what are the different areas, let's say, that I've dealt with that people have called and reached out and said, here's my situation. So you have some people who, let's say, have, this is mostly male because I think it's a male condition, but let's say areas of muscular dystrophy, those types of ailments which are genetic by nature and are progressive on some level. So th that's also meaning progressive plays a big role here. Will this illness get worse? What's it going to look like? Things may look like one way now, but who knows what it's going to look like down the line. And you have life expectancy. So there certainly is a level and you have to really be knowledgeable in what the disability is and how it plays its role. But those are some. You have a lot of people who, let's say, had a spinal cord injury. I happen to know that the people who have gone through that experience, you could have someone who's blind, so you could have someone who's deaf, you could have someone who has some other rare genetic diseases. Those are kind of the, the areas that I've dealt with. And you could have someone who, let's say, has had cancer in childhood, but sometimes that can interfere with reproductive areas or things like that. Are there any challenges that may disqualify someone from ever getting married? You have to have really big shoulders to be able to say, this would disqualify someone. I mean, what about reproductive health? What if somebody has some sort of condition or injury that prevents them from having children? Is that a disqualifier or you find somebody? It obviously needs to be spoken about and, and decided. And again, there is this filtration process that happens naturally where it's like people are not going to get involved. My honest and core belief is that, and again, I don't want to get into the area of, let's say, things that are outside of physical disabilities. But I, I think that everyone deserves to be able to experience a relationship on some level. It's not going to necessarily look the same for everyone. And sometimes there may need to be bigger check-ins with reality in terms of what the likelihood is. But to say that someone doesn't deserve or is completely precluded from having a relationship within the context of Judaism it is a very hard thing for me to promote. And that was an unfair question. I'll give you that. What haven't I asked you yet that we want to make sure we cover? I, I've done a couple of other podcasts and I just want to kind of provide resources to other people. I, I've done a podcast with Why You Connects where I went through the dating process and things that are there to consider. So for example, not every disability, this is another good thing that maybe goes back to the previous question. Not every disability can be easily noticed on a first date. So how do you play that? Do you tell them before? Do you tell them after? You obviously have to tell them at one point. How do you navigate that? That's something that's very, very important. There's the area of what does a parent do when they're watching their child who deeply wants to get married and they don't have the answer for them and their child is suffering and how am I supportive for them through this process? And then there's how do I develop this relationship? How do I handle the logistics? So there's definitely a lot of factors. I, I've dealt with those in other contexts. And in terms of people wanting to reach out, if this is something that speaks to them, there is, you know, things that I'm trying to put in the works to be supportive here. My wife and I do work together to try and help and support people through this process. Not as much necessarily in making shidduchim because it is challenging and very time consuming, but there are people that I'm aware of that I often send them to, to be able to help in that area, but really to provide the emotional support and speaking out some of the areas that may be coming up for them through this difficult process. This question is going to be, I, I feel like you've covered the things that people want it. We could link it. We yeah. could link all stuff. Right. What challenges and issues come up for people who have physical disabilities that may be a direct result? Like what behavioral or emotional issues come up for people? That's a very, very good question. That really depends on the person. So if someone went through an accident, right, let's say. Now, I guess the way I want to frame this, because I want to be very, very careful, is that this totally depends on the person. I don't want to say that everyone with one issue or has a physical disability is this way. I want to kind of give a spectrum. And what I want to do is actually try and elicit positivity around perhaps the qualities that someone with a disability has that actually make them much more suitable and much more primed for a relationship. So in all these cases, if someone's gone through something that's very, very challenging and you see that they are socially with it, they're accomplished, they have a job, which are all important things that people should have. They have a plan, they have a future. They understand what they want, which are all attractive, they're confident. All those qualities, then likely there is not a lot that is as a result, other than bonuses in the fact that they have learned through experience, which most other people don't have, 
how to deal with adversity, which inevitably will come up in a marriage. So that is a huge plus. Given that they dealt with it and worked through it. Given that they've learned how to deal with a challenge that may be far greater than any of the challenges that come up in a marriage, and they figured out how to be viewed as someone who's successful, accomplished, has a job, is able to build a family, is able to be responsible, is able to plan out and problem solve and do all those things despite a tremendous challenge. It should be a tremendous source of pride and it should be something that other people look at and say, wow, this person actually possesses so many qualities that are exactly what I would want to look for. Yeah, I may not want it with the wheelchair, but in a certain sense, the fact that this person has been able to accomplish what he has with the wheelchair makes me feel really, really comfortable that if something came up, which inevitably does in a marriage or difficulty, he will have the tools or or she will have the tools to be able to navigate this in a process because they have experience. So that is the positive element. Could there be other elements that come around behaviorally that have impacted? Of course. And so I think what you're really looking for is where is the person now despite their past, which is always what we look for in any of the areas that may have come up, meaning if someone was an addict or any of the other things that we could say are a red flag, you're looking for where they are now And depending on where they are now and making sure that you're doing a very, very good job of analyzing the situation and speaking with experts, that could be used as a source of pride, that there's a lot of growth that they've gone through because of their experience, that some schnook, you know, who's 21 and just came back from yeshiva may not have yet had that experience to navigate those waters when they come. Can you give some examples? I think by definition, if someone goes through a challenge, they will need to work on their munabitachon. And I'm a firm, firm believer in the work that I do as a therapist. Very often, Baruch Hashem, I work with the from community a lot that many of the mental health issues, particularly, let's say, an area of anxiety or things like that, with a healthy relationship with Emun Tachon, actually make a lot of the challenges much, much easier to go through and process. So, for example, if I have a firm understanding that even the difficult times are Hashem's plan for me. And this is part of my tafkid. And I've learned to develop that earlier. So then ultimately when something comes up where someone may lose a job or they may find out that this happened in the family, which sometimes could bring a lot of stress into a marriage, there is a perspective that they're able to bring of, yeah, let's go back to those tools that helped me through my childhood. It, you could push me if you're looking for something else. I want to just stories, real life stories. My wife and I do have different approaches in terms of how we deal with things because of our upbringing. I think that's likely true of most couples given their their difference of upbringing. But obviously my upbringing, having a spinal cord injury at the age of six is much more unique than hers was. And so therefore it could cause certain elements for me to approach in a different way than she would. That was still not an example, but I'll, <laughs> I'll let it slide. Based on the research I've done, your wife doesn't have physical disabilities, right? No, she does not. So it's funny, actually, because I dated, I think, three girls from Passaic. So something in Passaic, I don't know, they're, I guess, more open-minded or maybe it's the schools they go to. I don't know what it is. Girls that did not have a disability. Anyway, at the VART, someone comes up to my grandmother, who's not a pushover at all. And she says, like one of her friends says, okay, like, give me like the inside scoop. Like, I couldn't notice anything at the VART. So like, tell me what's wrong with my wife. So... My grandmother, who's like just so great and terrific, says, and obviously the question is based on like, how could it possibly be? What am I missing? Like, it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense in my head. And my grandmother said, oh, you didn't hear like what she has. She has two, two wings and like a a halo over her head. And again, I, I think it is very hard. And I, you know, my wife doesn't speak out like in these type of platforms as much, but very often if there's a couple going through something and they want to understand what the experience is. From her side, she will speak because she thinks it's important. It's so hard for people to kind of fathom that someone could be open-minded on this level, that someone could kind of see something that they're happy with. And even for myself, because I think I'm much more closed-minded than my wife is, I questioned, you know, like, why, right? At certain points in the relationship, you know, like, why would you do this? Because I understood what the reality on the ground was. So I think there are people out there, I will tell you that, that's something that very often comes up if I am helping someone who has a disability and they're dating someone that doesn't have a disability. The person who has a disability feels very self-conscious during, during that process, wants to know what are they saying after? Do they ask about this, this, and this? And to me, it still boggles my mind a little bit. I will say that, but it does exist. There are certain people who will kind of deal with the logistics after and really be able to see the outsider areas that they like or are attracted to 
and depressurize what I described in the beginning of it, feeling so pressured, like I have to decide. And their approach will be like, maybe I could just get to know this person and see where those things go. Any closing remarks for anyone? This could be some words of chizuk for people with physical disabilities, as well as non-undiagnosed issues people. <laughs> yeah, we have to work on the marketing. I've not, I haven't spent enough time to kind of come up with all the terms and labeling them in the best, most appropriate way. I am in the process actually of like trying to arrange a shidduch event that is kind of open to all. And so I have to work on kind of the language there as well. But what I would say is shidduchim is hard. Shidduchim is hard no matter who you are, what your scenario is. And sometimes you may feel like, where's it going to come from? Am I ever going to get married? How could it be? How will it happen? And ultimately, like I pointed out, and I hope I've made it an emphasis, because uh, I once asked a, a really, really big guddle about this issue and like, what do we do? And what's the best thing we can offer to people? Because people reach out. And it really is developing a strong connection to Hashem and recognizing, uh, and it's hard because sometimes people want something more concrete. But the most important tool I can honestly say, and when I was going through this, that I asked multiple Rebbeim because I was having a very, very hard time with it. Everything was about strengthening your emuna, was about strengthening your relationship with Hashem and trying to be able to see it through the lens of the Torah and try and add meaning to your challenge that way. Also extremely important, which I would say is that sometimes people base their entire existence on being able to get married and like, how can I be productive if if I'm not married, because we put so much emphasis on this. When one is single and they are dating and they have, let's say, a little bit more freedom, that's a time where, if used correctly and with the proper coaching and guidance, can really be a time of tremendous development so that Amir Tzashem, hopefully when it is your time to get married, you can look back at those time periods, which were very, very difficult, and see how they made you stronger, how you took the time to develop yourself, how you we're able to bring a lot more Amir Toshem into your marriage because you utilize the times that were very, very difficult for you. Yeah, and this could apply to anyone waiting for something that seems out of their control and that seems like everyone else is able to get. Thank you so much, Rabbi Eli Portal, for joining us today. I think this was very enlightening. This was great. Hatzlacha Rabba. Thank you for listening until the end. Would you like to know what's happening next week? So join the WhatsApp discussion group because I might be throwing in a vote again to see what will be coming out next week. We have some wonderful episodes in the queue waiting to come out. Make sure to check out the episodes on jewishcoffeehouse.com of the other podcasts like Intimate Judaism, Chochmat Nashim, Orthodox Conundrum, and Let My People Eat. And keep spreading the word by sharing these podcasts with your friends. Make sure to follow them so you don't miss any notifications on your phones when new episodes are dropped. I am Francisca, a podcast success coach. So I help you with all your podcast needs and I'm excited to keep doing that. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or feedback, please do not hesitate to reach out. I love hearing from you and we'll see you next time. 